that I always talk about my, my obsession about um, our history. I, I just want to um, just go tell you a little bit about why I have that obsession. Um, when I was growing up, being called an Indo was certainly very negative. It wasn't until I matured and dug down deep into my family's history that I realized it was a badge of honor. How many of us, how many of our families have overcome the atrocities of World War II, the genocide called the Garcia, the loss of the homeland, repatriation, and for those in this audience, immigration? We have overcome these five traumas and we have overcome the pain and have done well. I hear some people say that we share a past that doesn't exist anymore. I can't help but chuckle when I hear that. Look at each one of you here. The past lives within us and we carry it with us and we will pass it on to our children. We Indos are resilient, tenacious, persevering, and hardworking. It is time that we pat ourselves on the back. It is time to honor our heritage rather than look down on it. Tonight, we honor Indo history, our culture, and resiliency. Tonight, at the 70th year commemoration of the end of World War II, we feature and will discuss a part of our history that is hardly talked about or that the world knows about. We will hear from Jamie Stern, our very own third generation Indo. <laughs> yes, Jamie, we are so proud of her, who's conducting a survey to map where we all ended up globally. I will leave it up to Jamie to tell you all about this. And lastly, I'm gonna to try to hurry. I wanna thank Penny Nays for, for partly sponsoring this program because she made um, us realize that we needed to get through with this because we were wondering whether we, we should or not, but she gave us the impetus. Thank you, Henny, wherever you are, thank you so much. Um, and then I would like to thank the TIP team, the Indo Project team. You don't know how hard they were. Um, we spent hours and hours talking about how we want to share our history and our culture every month for two hours straight. We plan, and I hope that you will enjoy uh, what we've planned for you tonight. So um, I will give you now um, Jamie Stern, who will tell you all about her master thesis that she did and what she's doing now. Too early. Most of us feel like that though. If we could keep them forever, we would. 
But um, I lost my opa, who I was very close with when I was five, and my oma, who I was able to develop a very deep, close relationship with, I lost her when I was 14. And that was all before I had the opportunity to even think of all the questions I wanted to ask them. So I feel I missed out on that. And by, by being a part of the Indo Project and keeping up with all that we're doing and talking with people and meeting other Indos, I feel like I'm getting the opportunity to, to be with them again. And it's beautiful. And I certainly hope that for the third generation, they all get to have this wonderful, passionate feeling. So um, I'm going to continue now. I'm the director of research with the Indo Project. Uh, I have finished my master's thesis on uh, the Indo migration, our diaspora out from uh, Indonesia after it had been the Dutch East Indies. Uh, and so we're picking up a whole lot of traction in these most recent years. Uh, so today, I'm going to talk to you about Indos today the development of our present-day geographic portrait. Um, geography is what I study, and for me, I live and breathe it. I find it so exciting. So <laughs> um, we, we were reached, we, we had a professor over at La Roche College uh, recently reach out to us. This was a couple years back. His name is Dr. Aslan Kajudin, and he is a professor of sociology. He's the chair of the department there at his school. And he contacted us and wanted to find out if we would um, help him connect the dots. And um, at this point, our first, our very first groundbreaking research had already been started and completed. That was the 2012 Indo survey that many of you had participated in. And we were able to use that as the base for all of the uh, topical studies that Aslan and I did together. Um, so we recently got published back in March 2015 this year. We were published um, in the International Journal of Politics, Culture, and Society. And this was extremely exciting because the Indo Project is all over it. The Indo Project was an integral part of it. Uh, and it's magnificent. We're picking up momentum. We are we are um, popping up uh, on the, the school library server. You can find us. We're, we're Googleable at this point. This article pops up too, although it's not too easy to come by, um, just because of the internet journal. <laughs> so if you have any questions about that, just come and see me. We will, we will figure it out together how to get a copy and read it. Um, so the title, I, I want to talk about the title. Um, my mom found the title to be very jarring. She's like, I'm a Dutchman. That, that is not nice. What is that? So let's go into that just for a moment. So this is a portion of our abstract. So Indos, as we all know, are mixed uh, of Dutch and Indonesian descent. Our history can be traced to the Netherlands 300-year colonization of Indonesia. Um, as an in-between people, Indos were accorded the privileges of a Dutch colonial class situated above the native Indonesians that placed below Europeans in terms of status. Um, now, we all, we all know that. Uh, we also know that despite their Dutch citizenship, the Indos were often marginalized due to their distinctly hybridized culture and mixed physical appearance. Then during the Japanese occupation of the East Indies, um, the Indo's political and historical association with the Dutch subjected many among them to numerous persecutions. Uh, similarly, this Dutch identity would also place the Indos on the opposite side of the Indonesian independence struggle, creating their massive exodus to the Netherlands after the Second World War. In Holland, Indos were treated more like foreigners than compatriots, and often referred to as brown Dutchmen. And that's where we get that word, those two words. So this drove many Indos towards further migration across the globe, including to the USA. Yay! Yay! And here we are. And that's 
that's where my research uh, originally had first picked up. So moving forward, now here we are in America, uh, the first generation angels were reluctant to share their traumatic history. I don't like that word, reluctant. And I'd actually like to open it up just for a moment, open up the discussion. What word do you think would be more appropriate? Because when I see the word reluctant, I feel like it was like it was such a conscious choice not to say anything. And for some, it may have been. But for others, I believe that it was because there was not the time to do it. There was not the time to feel the ache. There was not the opportunity when you wanted to just enjoy the present and keep moving forward and keep going and keep watching your children grow and develop a new life and reestablish yourself. So does anyone have another word for me to use? Maybe hesitant. Hesitant. I like that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as we know, they encourage their sons and daughters to fully embrace Americanhood and by their silence, urge them to leave the past behind. Despite this, many among the younger generations have begun to show a collective interest in reconnecting with their Indo heritage. But without an existing homeland to serve as a cultural anchor, our scattered Indo community has resort resorted to intense cultural um, imaging and social networking to define our place as Indo-Americans. Um, and so this, this is exactly what the Indo Project is actively doing. Um, TIP sponsored the 2012 Indo survey and individual interviews were formed, uh, which formed the basis for the multi-theoretical approach that we use uh, to produce our scholarly work um, was, was a wonderful example of it. Um, so we then presented our work to that journal, and they, they liked it, and they published us. <laughs> OK, so that's, that's where we are with some of our most recent work, our most recent research. Um, if you want to access it, here's some of the information, but come to me if, if you have more questions. Moving on to what I'm doing right now. Um, this is a compilation of everything that we have been collecting over the last four years, four years worth of data, and it's constructing our geographical portrait. We're seeing where everybody is distributed. We like our coastal regions. <laughs> California is most heavily concentrated with Indos. We like Florida too. <laughs> Moving into the map a little more deeply, I want everyone to be able to get an idea for our time frame of the data collection. So all of the um, uh, square diamond shaped blue ones were taken in 2012. That was our very first Indo survey. And then we use that information as a basis to start our next phase of research, which is the Worldwide Indo Challenge. And so I encourage everybody, if you haven't participated in it, please um, go to our website and take the Worldwide Indo Challenge. It's totally anonymous, and it just helps us to continue to establish our point that we are here. And if you want to show that off, we are here. Um, I also want to point out that in case anybody's worried about duplication of answers, we actually only have a 16% chance that some of the um, uh, points of data are duplicates. And this is good, in a way, because it helps speak for some who might not have taken the, uh, the survey. Uh, it doesn't damage our statistical results either. So this, this really is what we're looking at. This is our, our distribution. Nobody likes North Dakota and South Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, OK, so keep in mind these points and what they look, uh, what they look like, the yellow, the red, the green. 
Um, so they're all recent. It's all from the last four years. And I have one, one quick special thing for you. And I will be done. on the Indo population in Southern California. Unfortunately, at least to me, very unfortunately, she left it on a very dismal note. And she just suggested that this was it. And we were going to fade off into the sunset. And I, I disagree greatly. Um, so to that I say this is not the end of the Indo saga. And with your help and interest, we continue. that we started against Japan for not showing uh, Unbroken. Um, but I want to uh, talk a little bit about movie industry today, because uh, we're watching a movie today. Um, and I'm going to read this. Um, the year 2014 was an extraordinary year with not just one, but two movies coming out of Hollywood that dealt with World War II in Asia. While both Unbroken and Railway Man were necessarily blockbusters and were still early, Claim. They were extraordinary in that they were quite accurate in portraying the struggle of two POW survivors who were crippled by PTSD, nonetheless redeemed themselves and were able to compete in their capital's captors. Our relatives, you, the first generation who went through the war and who are now in the winter of their lives, went through a similar ordeal, but, and this is where Hollywood got it historically wrong, the survivors cannot redeem themselves and reconcile with Japan, since recent setbacks under the leadership of Prime Minister Abe 
have triggered a whitewashing of Japanese atrocities during the war. In recent textbook reforms by Abe's government, the Nike massacre has been downgraded to a mere incident. And comfort women whose existence, whose existence Abe has repeatedly denied have been edited out of the current textbooks altogether. When Angela Merkel visited J Japan this year, she had compelling advice for the Japanese. Coming to terms with the past, she said, is a prerequisite for reconciliation. In this talk, I want to address how the Indo-Dutch legacy has reached a state of extinction through the lens of popular world culture. But since many of you don't know me, I should first tell you how my backstory is closely aligned with yours. And, uh, growing up in the Netherlands, my Indies family background was shrouded in silence. However, when I started digging, I found that more than three generations of my maternal family had been there as administrators and planters. While I had started the story with my grandfather, the story soon became Harry's, a cousin of my mother's, who was part of the next to last family to run the family plantation, and whose father was tortured by the, Jean, by the Japanese, and whose sister were brutally murdered by Indonesian revolutionaries during the massacres that took place at the time of the revolution in Surabaya, which was on October 28, 1945, now called the Day of Heroes. As a child of seven, an eyewitness at the time, Harry had never shared the details of his story with anyone, not even his wife or children. And although my mother advised against me contacting him, I wrote him a letter, whereupon he wrote back and said, let's talk. On a rainy Sunday afternoon in the Netherlands, he told me the entire story, sobbing. A story so gruesome and incredible at the same time that had all the hallmarks of the Hollywood movie. That story became the book Silent Voices. And before I sent the manuscript to my American publisher, I told my husband that Harry had to approve it. After reading it, he emailed me back within 48 hours and said this. I had three guardian angels in my life. My sister, Willie, who always looked after me, the Indonesian who rescued me, and you, because you see me. It's as, if, it's as if I've been living inside a bunker all my life, and you've been the only one who's hit a hole in that bunker through which love and likes now come pouring in. That love consists of interest, compassion, and contact like I've never experienced in my life. Fellow historian and camp survivor Vini Rinsema of Milal added to this, you have not only opened the bunker, you've been on a journey with an imprisoned man you acknowledged him fully. It's called recognition, but it's so much more. He's become centered in his own life because of this. This is something that no one has been able to understand in Holland of the people who had been through the war in the Indies. One did not know what it was. Due to all sorts of reasons, the Indo-Dutch legacy in the US is hiding in a bunker as well and is screaming to get out. There are all sorts of reasons for this, which I won't go into now, but I want to share with you how the international movie industry is complicit in silencing our story. Of course, movies are only one reflection of our shared popular culture, but as a barometer as to what gets exposure and what is shared with mass audiences around the world, movies are a good indicator of what people know or may not know about a topic like World War II. So, I tell you all the World War II movies that have been made in the last 20 years. Uh, that's 242 total. Of these, 192 are set in Europe, only 50 in the Asian Pacific theater. 18 of the latter are made by the Japanese, which leaves us with 32 movies made by non-Japanese studios. Of the 32 movies, I sifted through the topics and found this. 10 deal with the Sino-Japanese War, four with the Filipino-Japanese War, three with the US-Japanese War, two with the Taiwanese-Japanese War, two with Thailand, Burma, 
two with uh, the Malaysian Japanese War, two with Emperor Hirohito, two with Japanese war crimes trials, two with Hiroshima, two with other topics, and one, well, you, you guessed it. <laughs> There's only one in the last 20 years. Um, so there's, uh, this was Paradise Row, 1997. It deals with, according to the American movie description, an allied, not a Dutch POW internment camp in Sumatra, even though most of the internment were Dutch. In fact, this is the only movie that was ever made about World War II in the Dutch East Indies, which is telling if you compare it to the more than 300 movies that have been made about the Holocaust since 1945. Interestingly, these include a few Japanese movies about, about the plight of the Jews and Anne Frank in particular, the Japanese author of Anne Frank for some reason. Um, now, the next slide shows you the contrast. Why only one movie? If you see these statistics, 80% 80, 80 of all people who were interned by the Japanese found themselves in camps in the Dutch East Indies. Total number of war dead. Four million, uh, we, we're not quite sure, but that's a guesstimate, including two million in the uh, The Dutch East Indies ranks number five in the top ten countries with most more dead. Japan in that list is number six. And the majority of Dutch war casualties, and I'm not talking about the Jews, 73%, which is very high, 73% uh, who died in the Holocaust, the majority of Dutch war casualties rest in war graves in Indonesia and North in the Netherlands. Now, astoundingly, while the Dutch East Indies was a major war arena and site of suffering for the Indonesians and for the Dutch, there hasn't been a single feature focusing on that war in the Indies by a Dutch filmmaker or studio. So, while the whole world probably wants us to move on and stop whining about something that happened 70 years ago, that is a hard thing to do and may not be an option for us at all. Our story is not complete, and it hasn't been fully told, shared, or seen by the world. As such, we're still withering away in the bunker, or Harris bunker, I should say. And with the absence of popular narratives available to mass audiences and Japan's recent denials of our suffering, the Indo-Dutch legacy may well be on its way to becoming a mere footnote in history especially in countries outside of the Netherlands, like the US and Australia. This has been exacerbated by the fact that we don't have a lobby. While China and South Korea have been very vocal about the protests and above mentioned uh, and recent textbook reforms in Japan, the Dutch Indians are no more, and compared to other countries, the Dutch government has had a rather shabby record when it comes to fighting for the recognition of the suffering of what many in the Netherlands still consider former colonizers. Now, in my view, we have 30 years to correct the fact that the Indo-Dutch legacy becomes extinct, so that by the time that the 100th anniversary of the end of World War II rolls around, we can hopefully speak of the Indo-Dutch legacy having entered the mainstream. But this takes effort and a huge commitment of the Indo-Dutch community in the US that in the past has not been a good advocate for itself, for reasons that many of you probably mentioned. We have to do a number of things, and I want to call this the AAA of Indo organizing, meaning affirmation, advocacy, and activism, which involves this. First of all, there needs to be more cross generational dialogue and education to end the end of silence of the first generation and provide context and history to the next generations who we are and how we ended up here. The Indo Project is doing some of this by organizing nights like these, but also uh, by hopefully organizing more events, more talks, uh, and more get-togethers, more meetups, you name it. Number two, preservation of the past by means of collecting and storing all histories. We have a digital archive at the Indo Project, and this is important because the last witnesses of the war are dying. So we can't afford to have these stories fall through the cracks, especially in light of Japan's recent denials again. 
community building locally and worldwide. Uh, we at the Indo Project feel the, the our organization is a vehicle for that. We are connected with groups in the Netherlands. We communicate with them. We share our plans with them. Uh, we do a lot not only to raise more awareness at home but also abroad. Number four, and I think this is an important one, taking a stand in guarding uh, our history. But we did that with the Unbroken Petition, uh, and we also did it with some community, uh, and you may not have seen this, but we did some behind the scenes, we did some uh, community organizing with the Chinese and the Koreans around the recent visit by Prime Minister Abe to the US Congress, during which he uh, uh, stopped short of an apology once again. Uh, number five, claiming our position in the multicultural fabric of the US. We are not Latinos, no. Our sambal rocks way more than salsa, and our history may be painful, but it's rich, multicultural, and very weird. Uh, number six, uh, building a memorial and Indo community center, which can also serve as a global center for dialogue, truth, and reconciliation with Japan as well as the Netherlands. Uh, this is one of the uh, utmost goals of the project. Both uh, Priscilla and I went on a fact-finding mission uh, in Indonesia and the Netherlands to see if uh, there was room for such a memorial. And after a board discussion, we decided that uh, the priority really is to have a center here for us and for the next generations. Then, number seven, we need a movie in English, a real feature that tells our story truthfully and grippingly. Uh, since we're down the road from Hollywood, I just want to mention this is shameless self promotion. Uh, I, I do have a script and I have an award uh, winning filmmaker who's ready to get going. All we need is funds, uh, which is the hard part. Um, anyway, um, it could look something like this. This is a movie poster that the filmmaker made when he went to Cannes last year. Um, finally, Indo Pride is also putting your wallet where your heart is. The Indo Project is an all volunteer nonprofit, but to realize some of the above mentioned goals, we need to become a formal organization with an executive director and staff. Our destiny is what we make of it. And to honor the pain and suffering who went before us, we need to stand up for ourselves and claim ownership of the Indo-Dutch legacy in the US. Remember this, those who gave their lives during the Japanese occupation of Mercia made freedom and peace possible for us. We would be squandering that if we don't try with our culture, community, and contributions on the US map once 